Hi there, I'm Adam Burton, and I'm the pastor at Central Baptist Church in Maysville, Kentucky. Thank you for tuning in to my online Bible study. It's from The Gospel Project. We are live every Thursday night to study God's Word. This week's Bible study is titled, The Rebuilding of the Temple. We will see that God desires to dwell with His people and reveal His glory to them. To let you know where we are going in our study, here are the three points. One, God confronts His people about their misplaced priorities. Two, God encourages His people with His presence. And three, God promises His people greater glory is to come. We will get to our Bible study in just a moment. Before we do, one of the great things about our online Bible study is that we can engage in conversation. So as you watch, let me know what comments or questions you might have. Let us know what sticks out to you in this study. Lastly, we would love to connect with you on all of the socials. We are active on Facebook and Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Just search for CBC Maysville. Hey, stay tuned to the end for an important message about how you can go deeper into God's Word. Okay, let's get to our online Bible study. Our pride can blind us from seeing our shortcomings, but the world is quick to point out when we slip and fall short. Nothing wounds our pride more than being called out for a sin we have committed. It's uncomfortable when anyone calls us out over our mistakes, but it's even more difficult when it's those who are close to us. We don't like anyone to know that we fall and short and fail. This is why we often struggle to have real intimacy in community. We have Sunday school classes and community groups, life groups, and so on, but they are often lackluster. We hesitate to be honest and intimate because we don't want to be viewed as broken. We look around at everyone else who seems to have his or her life together, and we don't want to be the only one who doesn't have it together. But this isn't a healthy way to live, nor does it glorify God. What are some of the results of harboring secret sins? Well, we put a distance between ourselves and others, and even between ourselves and God. We struggle to love others and be loved by them because we are fearful of being known. Our worship is hallowed. We feel guilt and shame. We struggle to encourage others in faithful living, and we struggle to share the gospel. The following passages in Haggai show us the prideful Israelite people who feared the same sort of things that we do. God brought to light that the Israelites had put their hope and faith in other things, which was uncomfortable, and yet God was quick to welcome them back if they would repent and obey. In this session, we will consider how God's promise of His presence is a primary motivator to obedience. Now, too often, we think of obedience in the Christian life as perfunctory behavior that seems mundane. But this text reminds us that obedience is the natural response to the presence of God. And the presence of God in the people's rebuilding of the temple in Haggai points forward to the ultimate act of God's presence being known in the coming of Jesus. This Old Testament book will prove relevant to us as we realize that we are living out the same promise and commitment as the Israelites did in the context of Haggai. Our first point is God confronts His people about their misplaced priorities. God confronts His people about their misplaced priorities. Read with me Haggai chapter 1 verses 2 through 6. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you have never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm, and he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Notice in verse 2 that the Lord did not refer to the Israelites as my people, but instead called them these people. This was a cold, distant descriptor and indicated from the very beginning of the prophet's message that something was wrong. What could make God seem so distant and displeased with these people? They were unwilling to take the time to rebuild his temple. 
Have you ever heard someone when upset at, at a child say to his or her spouse, your child got in trouble today? Notice the emphasis. The parent's words indicate a distance from the child in an attempt to clarify his or her frustration or anger. Clearly, the child has done something or a number of somethings to create this kind of frustration. God was employing a similar verbal technique in this passage. God's people were returned to the promised land by the work of God through King Cyrus with the goal of rebuilding his temple. They had started in earnest rebuilding the altar for sacrifices and laying the foundation for the temple. But then their rebuilding efforts met with opposition from the surrounding peoples, and they stopped. It has been said that, that delayed obedience is disobedience. This seems to be a pretty clear picture of delayed obedience, and God was not happy about it. Think about this. What does delayed obedience say about a person's view of God? Well, it says that God is not, not important, that God's will is secondary to my own. That God doesn't want to understand my circumstances or what I'm doing right now. Or that God is unjust in His expectations. The people failed to focus on the Lord's house because they focused on their own homes and provision. But in all the ways they tried to fill themselves, they only found themselves lacking. They were hungry, cold, and struggling. They were empty, and God connected their lack of fulfillment to their lack of faithfulness. Listen to this quote. The God of the universe has spoken. We believe what He says, and we will obey. We must make a decision that we will hold to the face of all opposition and apparent contradiction. The powers of hell can never prevail against the soul that takes its stand on God and on His Word. The people of God had failed to obey God by not rebuilding or not building His house. They argued that the time had not yet come to rebuild the temple, yet they were providing nice homes for themselves and trying to build strong farms. Their self-centered view of the world was leaving them unfulfilled. God's word to them was an indictment. They were attempting to place their comfort ahead of obedience to God. They assumed that they knew better than God did about what would lead to their flourishing. But God made it plain for them that they would consider carefully their sinful ways. Think about this. What are some ways we might be guilty of putting our own comfort ahead of obedience to God? Maybe considering our finances from a worldly perspective instead of faithful stewardship to God, the owner of all things. Maybe refusing to share the gospel because it would take us out of our comfort zone and expose us to potential ridicule and harm making uh, sinful choices because they feel right and good to us instead of trusting and obeying what God has said to do or not do. Our second point is God encourages His people with His presence. God encourages His people with His presence. Read with me Haggai chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message, I am with you, declares the Lord. Haggai preached, and the people listened. The word of the Lord through the prophet was heard, and the people responded in faith and obedience. This is a beautiful picture of repentance. It is also a reminder that obedience to the inspired word of God is the visible evidence of a heart that follows God in faith. You know, to fear the, the Lord is to obey the Lord. So the evidence of our reverence and worship for God is our obedience to the word that God has given to us. The Bible reminds us that we do not work for our salvation, but it also reminds us that genuine salvation will always lead to works. You know, beyond the, the sacrifices of, uh, of contrition or offerings of goodwill, God loves our obedience. We live in a culture where it is common to be a Christian in name only. It seems to be okay, even welcomed and affirmed, that someone can claim to follow Christ without actually following Christ. But if there is no following Christ, then there is no faith in Christ. Listen to this essential doctrine, inspiration of Scripture. 
The inspiration of Scripture refers to God's direction of the human authors of the Bible so that they composed and recorded His message to humankind in their original writings. Occasionally, this inspiration was achieved through dictation, where God spoke directly to the original authors. Most of the time, however, this inspiration was achieved through the supernatural influence of the Holy Spirit, through the personalities of the authors, so that their writings can be considered the very words of God. In response to their obedience, God made a promise to His people that conveyed comfort and hope. I am with you. God's presence is the ultimate promise to His people. It is our greatest promise because separation from God was the curse that resulted from Adam and Eve's great sin in the Garden of Eden. Too often we get so caught up in the various blessings that God provides to us that we miss the greatest blessing of all, namely God Himself, whom we know through Jesus Christ. Reminiscent of Adam and Eve's exile from God's presence in the garden, God promised that He would remove His presence from the people on account of their gross sin. He fulfilled this promise through the Assyrians and the Babylonians, but He also promised to renew His presence with His people when they came to their senses and returned to Him. To accomplish this, He promised to deal with their sin and their sinful hearts. God made the way for His presence to dwell among His people for eternity. He sent His Son, Jesus, to die for the sin of the world and in atonement. And His resurrection guarantees our freedom and eternal life in the presence of God. All who come to Jesus in faith receive the promise of His eternal presence based on the perfection of His obedience. He is with His followers always to the end of the age. When He returns and God's dwelling is with humanity once more and forevermore. Listen to this essential doctrine, Christ exaltation. Whereas the death of Christ was the ultimate example of His humiliation, the resurrection of Christ from the dead is the first and glorious example of Christ's exaltation. Christ was exalted when God raised Him from the dead, and Christ was exalted when He ascended to the Father's right hand. He will be exalted by all cre of creation when He returns. All of these aspects work together to magnify the glory and worth of Christ, resulting in the praise of the glory of His grace in rescuing sinners. Think about this. How is God's presence with us in Christ meant to encourage us? Well, we are encouraged and strengthened to obey His commands by the Holy Spirit. We know that we have been forgiven of our sins by His presence with us. We have no need to fear our enemies since God is with us. Our last point is God promises His people greater glory is to come. God promises His people greater glory is to come. Read with me Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and the sea and in the dry land. And I will shake all nations, so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. God, once again, spoke through the prophet Haggai to encourage His people as they rebuilt His temple. Though they were ill-equipped to, the, the, to give the Lord the temple He deserved among His creation, He promised to provide for its glory. The phrases, the, the heavens and the earth and the, the sea and the dry land, showed that everything would be affected by the, this movement of God. The ability of God to, to shake all the nations is a reminder of God's omnipotence and authority. God is able to provide for His people, His temple, and His glory. Just as the elders noticed at the laying of the temple's foundation, God Himself voiced what others were surely thinking. Their new temple could not compare to the first. But that didn't dissuade Him from encouraging them to be strong and to work with the assurance of His powerful presence among them. Every nation under heaven was and is under the power and authority of God. He can and will move them as He wishes to accomplish His purposes. While there are kings and kingdoms that seem powerful beyond our ability to rightly comprehend, 
God is bigger still. Our responsibility in those moments when we are uncertain of our circumstances is to hope in God and trust in His provision. God will work to accomplish His purposes because all the powers of the world pale in comparison to His power. When it seems as if the arc of history is bending toward an unfortunate end, we have to be reminded that God is in control and is able to accomplish His will. Speaking of his hope for the success of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe, the Almighty God, working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. God promised to provide glory for His house in Jerusalem. He also promised to provide peace for His people in this place. God is the one who brings peace, and His peace, people are to practice peace and to pursue peace in their communities. Practice peace. The Christian is called to live moment by moment in the peace that God brings. There will be times when this is more challenging and even unnatural. In those moments, we have the di to discipline ourselves to trust God and rest in His peace. This is why we say we, that we have to practice peace. It's not natural for any of us. Now pursue peace. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 4-7, through 7, God spoke to the exiles who were living under Babylonian rule telling them to settle into their foreign accommodations and to pray and work for the welfare of the cities in which they were living. And the word welfare is the Hebrew word shalom. God calls His people to live in the peace that He brings and to do what they can to dismantle that peace wherever they go. Now the Hebrew word for peace in Haggai chapter 2 verse 9 is also shalom. Now when we hear the word peace, we often think of the absence of conflict. But shalom is a much more robust word. In simple terms, it could be understood as the holistic blessing of God. In other words, when God comes and works redemptively in the hearts and minds of His people, He comes bringing His shalom, His holistic blessing to His children. Our response to God's promise of peace, which uh, we ultimately receive in Christ, should be twofold. First, we should ask ourselves, am I personally walking in God's peace right now? If not, we need to trust Christ. We need to acknowledge our brokenness and ask God to provide redemption and restoration. Second, we need to ask ourselves, how am I working to see God's peace made known in my community? Think about this. How can God's peace on display in the lives of believers bring glory to God? Well, believers bring glory to God by trusting Him as they live in His peace. Believers can bless the world by pursuing God's peace in the world in the name of Jesus, which brings glory to God. Believers support their evangelistic efforts as they live in God's peace, demonstrating the validity and countercultural nature of faith in Christ. God created us for His glory, and so we could enjoy Him forever. Even given humankind's sinful and ultimately futile resistance to this purpose, God will not depart from it. So may we heed God's instruction through Haggai to the people and by extension to us to prioritize the worship of Him above all else in life, knowing that the pursuit of God's glory is for our own good. As God promised the people of Judah that one day He would fill His house with glory, so also do we who are in Christ look forward to a day of greater glory at Jesus' return. We can press forward in obedience and mission because God is with us now and because we have confidence that He will be present with us in an even greater way in the age to come. Because God has forgiven our sin and dwells within us, we live in a way that shows God is our priority so others may see His glory. Here are some ways for you to apply God's Word to your life. What steps of faith will you take to live for God's glory? How can your church work to spread the peace of God in your community? What priorities will you downplay to elevate the gospel mission of Jesus Christ in your life? Listen to this quote. 
Believers in Christ have every reason to be encouraged. Jesus Christ will ultimately reign as King of kings and Lord of lords over all who trust in Him. Our task is to persevere in the work He has called us to do. Pray with me. Father, our greatest comfort and greatest end is Your presence. We thank You for making Yourself present to us in Your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. We ask that by the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives, we would glorify you by showing others your greatness through our worship and telling them about the good news that God is with us because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Amen. Thank you for watching this week's Bible study. Remember that God desires to dwell with His people and reveal His glory to them. You know, when the people obeyed God and continued rebuilding the temple, God promised that the glory of the temple would be greater than that of the first. This promise was fulfilled in Jesus, who emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant to provide peace so God could dwell with his people and reveal his glory. Connect with me if you would like to know how Jesus could change your life forever. Hey, would you like to dig even deeper into this week's Bible study? Join our online Bible study Facebook group to get a short study each day. You can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash OBS Central. That's facebook.com slash groups slash OBS Central. And if you enjoyed tonight's Bible study, would you share it with your friends? Lord willing, I will see you next Thursday for our online Bible study. God bless.